Before we continue, let's just check if we are on the same page, if we really understand each other, because this is very important. We started this course with a pretty simple and obvious question. How to have happier life? How to be happier? But when you say that, what exactly do you mean? Are you referring to circumstances in your life? So you want to have more happy circumstances, or at least more happier circumstances in your life? Or are you referring to the experience of your life? So is it about circumstances or is it about experience? It is about experience, right? And you need to be very careful here because you can have terrible experience out of the best possible circumstances. So, for example, in our previous part, uh, we had an e example of you being offered the promotion. And that's an excellent circumstance! <laughs> What's not to like? <laughs> However, even that excellent circumstance can create a living hell out of your life. Why? Because you have certain attachments and you have certain resistances towards that idea, concept, situation, circumstance. Because you want more money, yes, <laughs> and you want to be respected, and you want to have a better social status and a bigger office. But at the same time, you wouldn't like to spend more time in your office, and you don't want to work during weekends because that will take time off your family, and you don't want that. But also, there may be some self-doubt, some resistance toward the idea that maybe I'm not good enough for the job. What if I fail? If I fail, that will immediately put me in the vibration of guilt, because I will be guilty of failing. <laughs> and also shame, because my colleagues will now know that I'm a failure, and that will put me in a vibration of shame. And of course, I don't want that. So, you can have terrible experience out of the best possible circumstances. Not to mention that we people, in general, are really terrible in anticipating and predicting what is really going to make us happy. Did it ever happen to you that you really, really, really wanted something? and you didn't get it. And at that time, when that was happening, it was terrible. It was a source of pain and misery and even agony. But now, when you think about it, whew, you are lucky it didn't happen. <laughs> you know, I almost married that high school sweetheart. <laughs> I'm so lucky because she didn't want me at the time, because that would change my life in direction that now I see it wouldn't be in my best interest. So, actually, I'm happy that she didn't want me. And of course, that was a source of great pain and misery at the time. And of course, sometimes you do get what you want, and then, yeah, you know, it's not that special. So, maybe you wanted some kind of sport car all your life, and you worked hard, and you fantasized about that car. And then, after a while, after a lot of hard work and saving money, you really did buy that car of your dreams. And it did make you happy for, I don't know, a week or a month or something like that. But now, you know, it's just a car. <laughs> It doesn't make you happy anymore. It's just uh, something that you have. Or sometimes you resist something. You don't want that, and you are doing everything that you can to avoid that situation or circumstance. And then somehow it happens, <laughs> nevertheless. And now you are really, really happy that it happened. So, actually, we don't know what's going to make us happy. Sometimes we think that something will make us happy, and it just doesn't. 
Sometimes we don't get what we want and that's a source of great pain and misery. And actually, maybe it was the best thing that ever happened to you. And sometimes not getting what we want is the greatest blessing that you could possibly imagine. We just don't know. And Buddha postulated that all our suffering, all our misery and emotional pain and agony had nothing to do with circumstances, only with our attitude towards that, meaning with our attachments and our resistances, or if you want to put it under one umbrella, one term, it is our desires. All the pain, all the misery, all the suffering comes from our inability to control our desires and has nothing to do with circumstances. You are not a victim. You know, because circumstances, well, you know, you can't control them. But you can control your reaction towards it. You are in control. You need to keep your attachments, your resistances, or your desires in check. And that will remove all suffering from your life. And we are using the word Buddha postulated for a reason. We don't want you to just believe it. But of course, it is a technique, it is a way of point of view that's time proven. It is 2,500 years old, and it is still being named Buddha's Noble Truths. You know, it is not a noble theory <laughs> or something like that. It is Noble Truth. But please don't take it for granted. Do a closer examination of yourself and see what's really making you suffer. So, maybe for example, just remember something that really made you angry yesterday or last week or last month. And then, calm down, don't get sucked into that anger. Just analyze it. You know, what really made me angry in that situation? Was it really about the circumstance? Or maybe it is about some my attachment, craving, resistance, rejection, and something like that. But be very careful, because your mind will immediately go into denial mode. When you try to really analyze what made you angry in some particular situation, your mind will immediately jump to denial, which is a form of resistance, and create more suffering <laughs> by saying, no, 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 it wasn't my fault. You know, it is objectively true. He made me angry, she made me angry, that situation made me angry, the politics, the football team, the whatever. It is all about them, it's not about me. But just if you are able to calmly look at that situation, you will realize, I mean, we suggest that you analyze that situation, but probably <laughs> you will realize that it has something to do with you. And situations that you don't want, and situations that you do want, and attachments, resistances, and so on. You are in control. It is all about your desires. And that's why one of the greatest spiritual teachers of our time, Edgar Tolle, brilliantly pointed out that suffering is necessary until you realize it is unnecessary. <laughs> because you need to suffer in order to get to the point when you will say, you know what, I don't want to suffer anymore. What's really causing my suffering? Your suffering will make you take a closer examination into yourself. And by doing so, you will realize that your suffering really doesn't have 
a lot to do with circumstances. I mean, circumstances are a trigger. But what's really causing your suffering is your attachments and your resistances. And you don't need that. And you can change that. And you can control that. But first, you need to recognize it. Then accept it. Don't go into, into a denial. Oh, no, no, it's not about me. It's about them. It's about situation. It's about whatever. Accept it. Own it. And then you are in position to change it. Suffering is necessary until you realize that, well, it's not. <laughs> it's unnecessary. <laughs> okay. So, according to second noble truth, <laughs> it's not second noble theory, it's second noble truth, all our suffering, all our misery and agony and emotional pain comes from our inability to control our desires and all you need to do obviously is to get rid of your desires right <laughs> now you know in eastern traditions typical spiritual teacher will say to you yes 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 just go and get rid of your desires and then he will wait for you to come back <laughs> because you will <laughs> because it is literally impossible to get rid of your desires because once you want to get rid of your desires, all that you are doing is adding another desire because now you desire not to desire. <laughs> so, removal of your desires is absolutely impossible without the second part of the Buddha's formula. Because Second Noble Truth actually says that causes of our suffering are desires and ignorance. Okay? Never forget that. <laughs> and when Buddha talks about ignorance, he talks about one very, very specific kind of ignorance. So, we are ignorant about zillion things. We don't know how many stars are in this galaxy. And that's kind of ignorance. We don't know that. But, you know, that doesn't matter. <laughs> that doesn't contribute to your pain and suffering. But there is one very, very specific kind of ignorance that is really important to address and investigate. And traditionally, it boils down to question, who am I? Now, you probably heard that, who am I, investigation, and a lot of people these days are talking about this being, that being the most important question, and it really is. But you know what? I've been teaching this for years, and I realized that, at least in our Western civilization, in our Western mindset, that question, who am I, for some reason, doesn't get people moving into investigation. You know, usually we, we don't understand that question. We immediately go to thinking about who am I? Well, my name is and I'm doing this and I'm doing and I'm a father and I'm a mother and I am a lawyer and I'm a doctor and you know, who am I? But, you know, it's not about that. It's about finding your true nature and for some reason, our Western mindset is uh, wired in a way that when you ask someone, who are you, he or she immediately, you know, looks onto the horizon and you see in her or her's eyes that she is ready to write a poem. <laughs> who am I? <laughs> what am I doing here? <laughs> but actually, it is much more interesting and it's much more intimate and it's much more important. So, let me just rephrase that question in this way. When you say I, what exactly do you mean by that? You know, I is the most frequently used word in English language. 
But when you say I, what exactly are you referring to? Okay. And now we'll start a kind of investigation by method of elimination. Because as one of the greatest detectives that the world ever had, okay, he's a fictional, but nevertheless, Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> or Arthur Conan Doyle as the author of the Sherlock Holmes, he used to say frequently, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. So, we'll approach that investigation into a question when you say I, what exactly do you mean? By method of elimination. So, when I say I, I'm referring to something that's, well, here. <laughs> Roughly. <laughs> so, I can eliminate the rest of the universe. I am not that window. I am not that chair. I am not you. I am not this whiteboard. I am not that pen. Anything that's outside of my body, I am not that. I am something in here. So, we already done a great job. <laughs> we eliminated the whole universe except something maybe that lies somewhere here. Okay. Every, anything that's not my body or inside it, it's not me. It's not what I say, what I mean when I say I. Let's go a step further. What about my body? Am I my body? When I say I, do I really mean my body? Okay. And actually, when you think a little bit about it, you, or when you say I, you are not referring actually to your body. Because that sense of I-ness, of beingness, of awareness that you are actually referring to when you say I, is somehow unchanged all your life. Your sense of beingness, your sense of I-ness, let's call it that way, was exactly the same when you were five-year-old, and it will be exactly the same on the day that you die. But your body is changing constantly. Just take a look at your picture when you were, I don't know, five years old. Your body looked well, quite differently <laughs> than it looks now. But that sense of I-ness, of I, that, that, that what you are talking about when you say I, didn't change a bit. And it will not. It is always present and it's always there. And, you know, sometimes people even, well, by some terrible accident, lose even significant parts of their body, maybe hand or leg, and they don't feel any less aware that they, they are not half the eye just because they lost half their body. You know? That sense of eyeness is there and it's ever present and it doesn't change. And your body changes constantly. I mean, not only from when you were five years old to today, but when you drink a glass of water, you quite literally changed your body. And then you eat something and you change your body. Even by breathing, you are inhaling oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide. And all your cells in your body are constantly regenerating. and Some are dying and some are being born, and some of them live a few hours, some of them live several years, most of them about six months. But nevertheless, the, all the, even, even those cells in your body that doesn't regenerate, like uh, central nervous system, your neurons, they constantly take new energy and sugar and water that they need and then remove waste. So, there is a, you know, kind of circulation of stuff, of the molecules, and your body is in constant change. 
but your sense of highness isn't. And you know, you can take a look at that situation even from a linguistic point of view. So, for example, I will say, this is my hand. Now, this is my hand. That hand belongs to me. I'm not that hand. Okay? This is my hand in the same way as this is my car on the parking lot. That car belongs to me. And this hand belongs to me, but I'm not that car. And if I scratch my car while driving, I'm not going to say, you know, I scratched myself. <laughs> it's just a property. And when you sit in your car, you are not your car. You are maybe driving your car, but you are not your car. So, this is my hand means that I am owner, in some way, of this hand, but I am not that hand. So, I guess that enough <laughs> to understand that when you say I, you don't actually mean your body. How about your emotions? Now there things start to, you know, blur a little bit that border between your I-ness and because you will say I am angry. I I am hungry. So, I hungry equals I am hungry. Hunger is me and I am hungry. But it is interesting to note that not in every language. Because, for example, Italians will say O fame. I have a hunger. They won't say I am hungry. So, you know, but let's stick to the English. So, we are hungry. We, I am nervous. I am angry. I am afraid or whatever. I am happy. I am joyful. On a linguistic level, you are somehow equalizing that I-ness with your nervousness and with your anger, with your emotional states. But, let me ask you a question. How do you know that you are happy, angry, afraid, hungry, <laughs> whatever? How do you know? Because you cannot use any tool on itself. For example, this pen. With this pen, I can write on any object. I can write on the wall, I can write on my hand, I can write on my whiteboard, I can even write on the, the other pen. But I cannot use this tool to write on itself. No, no tool can be used on itself. You can take a hammer, and with a hammer you can hit anything that you wish, any object, even air, <laughs> you can hit with a hammer. The only object that you cannot hit with a hammer is that same hammer. And you cannot see your own eye. You can see reflection of your eye in a mirror. And that's a completely different thing. But you cannot see your own eye. And you cannot bite your own tooth. That's right. <laughs> Bite your own tooth with your teeth. <laughs> you cannot do it. So, no tool can be applied on itself. If we really are our emotions, so when I say I, I mean my emotions, we wouldn't be able to perceive it. Because no tool can be used on itself. And still, you know perfectly well that yesterday, I was happy, and this morning I was nervous, and now I'm angry, and tomorrow I will be, I don't know what. You are able to perceive your emotions, and of course, changes. How exactly? Who is the perceiver? Where is that point from which you are able to perceive and witness your current emotional state. 
Obviously, when I say I, I don't mean my emotions. Because there is something inside that's not emotion, that is able to perceive emotions. So maybe I am my thoughts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we had well, brilliant philosopher from long ago called René Descartes that, called, that said that cognito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. So in a way, he, um, well, he, he took thoughts as a proof of his existence. And may, that very well may be so. But you are perfectly aware of your thoughts, right? So, who is the observer of your thoughts? And of course, you will say, I think that we should do this and we should do that, and I think that you're an idiot, and I think you're great, and so on, and that's great. But how do you know what you are thinking? Who knows what you are thinking? Or at least what knows what you are thinking? Since you cannot apply any tool onto itself, it's pretty obvious that thoughts are not what you are. Thoughts are something that you have. But thoughts are not what you are. Okay? Now, where are we? <laughs> so, we eliminated the whole universe. When I said I, I don't mean anything outside my body. I don't mean my body. And I don't mean uh, my emotions. And I don't mean my thoughts. What remains? When you really calm down, you are able to be aw you're aware of your body. You're aware of your emotions, and you're aware of your thoughts. But what, where is that awareness coming from? That is your true nature in Buddha language. <laughs> your true nature is observer of your body, of your emotions, of your thoughts. But where is it and what is it? Well. It is one of the most difficult questions <laughs> in the world. And ironically, we are all too well familiar with that sensation, because we all have it. And you can call it consciousness, you can call it awareness, I amness, beingness, even soul, if you wish. But it is something that is aware of your body, of your emotions, of your thoughts, but it is not identified with them, because, because no tool can be used on itself. If I were my thoughts, I wouldn't be able to actually see the changes in thoughts, in my thoughts, in my mind patterns. So, we are left with something that we are all too familiar with. And it's that ubiquitous that you can't even explain it. Because, you know, it just is. I mean, I, I, I can't help you with that. <laughs> and if you really sit quietly and leave your body to rest, and then you, can, you, you will see that you can observe your emotions, but you can choose to ignore them for a moment, and you clear your mind of your thoughts, and even when there, are, when there is no single thought in your body, something remains, some awareness, some presence, some space, you know, into all those things are somehow immersed into. Actually, you, you see that all your thoughts and emotions and body sensations, we didn't talk about that, but there are also body sensations. You know, there's some 
itching in the pit of your stomach when you're anxious and sometimes there is itching on your <laughs> hand, of course. All those things are observable from that point of awareness, but you are not any of them. You are using this body to move, to eat, to change your perspective. You are using your emotions, you are using your thoughts, but actually you are none of them. Your real nature, your point of perspective is somewhere in the space that is like a sky. You know, there is a whole that blue sky in the, up there. And sure, there are some clouds and sometimes and clouds are like your thoughts. But, you know, and sometimes there is a dark cloud because you have depressing thoughts. And sometimes these clouds are fluffy and uh, happy because you have happy thoughts. But you are not that. You are the space that contains all that. It's just like going to a movie, for example. So you go to your movie, yeah? well, and then you watch a movie. And if that movie is really good, really, you will somehow get immersed. You will live with your heroes on the screen and, oh no, don't go there, there lies the killer. <laughs> don't do that, oh my God, she doesn't like him. <laughs> he doesn't want to marry her. And it's all drama and you get su sucked up into it. But when you zoom out a little bit, when you, you know, get just a little bit bird eye view on that situation. Actually, you are sitting on a comfortable chair, watching the wall, watching the space where all those drama is happening. And it's great, you can get in, immersed to it, you know, it's exciting and it's interesting, and, but you are not that contents of the screen, you are the whole space where that drama is happening. And that screen can contain any kind of movie. It can contain an action movie, it can contain a romantic movie, it can contain a horror movie. But if you really understand that you are not content of that screen, but observer who is sitting in a seventh row watching all that. Now you can have a real chance of, well, at least analyzing your desires. But if you get sucked into the drama, you are entering the vicious circle that we already talked about. When you get sucked into, let's say, anger, world will suddenly seem antagonistic to you. And you will have thoughts and perceptions and memories. And all, you, you will have all the proofs in the world. And you will be objectively right because your mind will make that uh, true. It will trick you into believing that what you are seeing is objectively true. And that will lock you further into vibration of anger, because now you have proof that you created yourself in your mind <laughs> and believe that it's real, because your mind makes it real. It will lock you into vibration of anger, but that will create more angry thoughts and that will create more angry perceptions and memories and so on and so on. And this situation right now, where you are angry, will be stored in your mind for future reference when you are angry and so on, and you will get stuck in a vicious circle. But if you understand that you are not your emotion of anger, you are not thoughts that comes with vibration of anger, and that all those proofs, let's say, quote-unquote, 
that you are angry with a very good reason are just trick of your mind, then you will be able to pull out of that drama, to get out of that movie, stop being an actor and start being, well, actually director of it. Not just observer, but director of it. You can change whatever it is that you wish, but you need to be able to first understand that you are not the content of the screen, thoughts, emotions, perceptions, body, but something that is able to observe all that and even direct. But that's level two. <laughs> First, you need to understand that you are not in drama, but actually your true nature is watching that drama. But your mind will trick you into believing that that drama is everything. <laughs> that, that's your life. <laughs> this is your wife, and this is your mother, and so on and so on. Actually, it's not. You're observer of all that. Okay. So, if you want to uh, sum it up in one sentence, in one thought, there is a brilliant quote that says, We don't have a soul. We are a soul. We have a body. <laughs> And there you go. We just answered an age-old question, do we have a soul without even breaking a sweat? And the reason why we were struggling with that question for so long is because, well, it was the wrong question. Your soul or consciousness or beingness or awareness or I amness or isness or however you wish to call it, is not something that you have. It's something that you are. What you have is thoughts and body and emotions and emotional states and body sensations and perceptions and so on and so on. But there is something, you can call it soul or you can call it consciousness, that is witnessing all that, that is aware of your thoughts, that is witnessing changes in your emotions, but it doesn't get hurt by them. It's ever-present, it doesn't age, and it doesn't change. And it was always there and always will be. Uh, in a Buddha language, it was never born, so it cannot die. In a way, it is eternal, but as we will see later, maybe that's not the perfect word for it. But, you know, it is something, it is your foundational quality that is using your body and your emotions, and your thoughts, and your body sensations, to somehow experience all of that. But it is untouched by any circumstance. It cannot be hurt. And that shift from being part of a drama to being observer of it, it is a really fundamental shift that has immense practical applications for your life because it allows you to break out of the vicious circle. Because, you see, all of those emotional states, all of those, not just bottom part, have the quality, or they tend to at least, lock you in that particular vibratory state. And, for example, anger. So, something or someone made you angry, and now you are angry. Suddenly, you have angry thoughts, angry emotion, of course, body sensations that are consistent with well, being angry, and you very well know what that is, and your perception of life of worlds around you is suddenly shifted to something of antagonistic. So the world is antagonistic towards me. And all the circumstances that happen out there that are by itself neutral will be filtered through your mind. 
in a way that will prove you that you are quote unquote right. That you have every right or every reason to be angry. And that reinforces that particular state. Unless at some point you notice that you are angry. And that's point of, let's say, of waking up of your true nature. Something suddenly notices, no, wait a minute, I am angry. Why am I angry? And of course I have angry thoughts because I'm angry. And of course I have a perception of world out there being antagonistic to me because I am angry. But the real question is, who noticed, or at least what noticed, that you are angry? That is your true nature. That's something above your emotions or your thoughts or your perceptions. And once you realize that you are angry, once you notice that, and once you accept that, don't go into denial mode. That can be, I'm not angry. Or maybe, of course, I'm angry because they made me angry. Circumstances are like this, circumstances are like that. Once you notice that, you are in an excellent position to get out of that vibratory state and even learn from it. But let's just leave that for a few minutes. We'll come back to that. So, it is like being in a movie, you know. So, you are watching the movie and maybe it is a war movie or horror movie and people are dying left and right and it is terrible bloodshed. You being inside that drama, inside that war scenario or horror scenario, will be afraid. Of course, you will be afraid. But from the perspective of the observer, someone sitting in the seventh row on the comfortable chair, observing and witnessing all that drama, that cannot be hurt. You know, you know that you are safe when you are sitting in a movie theater watching a war movie and you're not going to die. No one is going to get out of the screen and shoot you. You know that. But if you are inside that drama, if you really get sucked into it, and if that movie is really good, it will suck you in. You know, you will live with emotions and thoughts and situations that our lead character maybe is going through. And you will feel all those um, fear or anger or pride or desire that your character is going through. And you can allow yourself to get sucked into that if you enjoy that. But if you don't enjoy that, just remember that you are not in the drama, although it may seem like it. <laughs> you are actually the whole screen that at this, this particular moment contains that kind of drama that's making you, let's say, afraid. But actually, you're quite comfortable and safe sitting in a very good chair with some popcorns in your head and observing all that. You know. And once you realize that, you will be invincible because not only that you will not allow yourself to get sucked into a drama, into emotions and thoughts and perceptions that you do not prefer, you will actually be able to direct that movie. But we'll talk about that in later chapters. For now, let's just stick to this. When you feel something, when you are stuck into emotional state that you do not prefer, it can be shame, guilt, grief, fear, desire, all you need to do is remember that you are not any of that. You, what, what, what you really are, what your true nature is, what you really mean when you say I, is a neutral observer of all that. And you can choose to shift your vibration, but 
first you need to get out of the vicious circle of any of those vibrations are trying to lock you in and actually <laughs> giving you full experience of that particular situation or vibration. First, you need to remember to, to pull out of it or at least to notice that you are angry. Once you notice that you are angry or afraid or ashamed or guilty, you are in a position to change that. First, you notice, then you own it. That's a very important step. Don't go into denial. No, no, that's not true. Of course, I'm angry because... No, no. You own it and then you can analyze it. Because you know that what's making you angry has something to do with some of your attachments and some of your resistances. What exactly is that you're attached to that's making you angry in that particular situation? Or afraid, or guilty, or ashamed. And then you will be able to change that. You know. Uh, you can choose to watch a movie or to be part of it. And if you like the movie, be part of it. Be an actor. But if you don't, remember that you are an observer. You can pull out, watch that situation from neutral position, from safe position, where you cannot be hurt. When you are observing your emotions and thoughts, however they may be uncomfortable, and then analyze what's really happening, what made you come to that well, situation. All circumstances are neutral. All circumstances are neutral. It is how you choose to respond or react if you are unconscious. If you are not aware of the process, then you will react. If you are aware of the process, you can respond to that. It's how you respond to that that will give positive or negative meaning to that circumstance and that will give you positive or negative effect in your life. And being a neutral observer of your life doesn't mean that things are going to stop happening. <laughs> no, no, no. Things are, con will continue to happen and there will be circumstances that you do not prefer. But actually it is a, a point, it is a place from where you can learn something. Okay? Not all circumstances are going to be pleasant, of course. You are not going to enjoy all of them. But you know, it's just easier if you do. <laughs> And you will enjoy circumstances when you realize, once you realize that maybe they are going to be pleasant and you are going to enjoy that. So that's a win for you. Or they are going to be unpleasant and you are going to learn from that. And that's a win too. So it's a win-win situation. You cannot get into a situation that is completely useless to you. <laughs> you, know, you, you will choose how to respond to a situation and you can choose to learn from it or you can choose to enjoy it. And you don't need to enjoy it, but it is just easier if you <laughs> do. So let's get to some you know, everyday examples just to see how that goes. We already discussed the situation that each and every one of us has well, most of our days. And it is waking up to an alarm clock. So, your alarm clock goes tee 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 that means it's time to get up. And let's say it's some regular Monday, so you need to go to work. And usually, in the minds of most people, in that situation, one of two questions will pop up in the first few seconds <laughs> of your waking state. It is either I didn't get enough sleep or I don't have enough time. Now, let's see what really happens when you have that situation. So, your alarm clock goes to TTT and let's say that your first thought is, I didn't get enough sleep. And then your mind will continue to complain. 
and I don't want to go to work. So it is all about your attachments and your resistance. I don't want to go to work. I want to be happy and I want to be free. And I want to be able to choose what I'm going to do with my life and not just, you know, go to the place where I don't like and so on. And we'll discuss that already in detail. So, but you know that sensation. And suddenly, you are going to feel heavy. And you are going to assume that that heaviness, that laziness, that sloth comes from, well, the fact that you didn't get enough sleep. But it's just not so. The heaviness is coming from your own resistances. Your own resistances are creating that heaviness in your body that's making you more difficult to get up. It has nothing to do with circumstances. If you slept two hours or five or ten, it has everything to do with your resistances. And let me prove that to you. Now, let's say the situation is identical. The alarm clock goes off and you're waking up. But today, you're not going to work. You are going to catch a plane. So you're waking up in order to catch a plane that will lead you to a two-week vacation, all-inclusive, all-paid vacation, to the destination of your dreams. Huh? How about that? Do you feel heavy now? <laughs> now imagine that situation just for a second. You are waking up. Everything is exactly the same. Just as in the previous example when we woke up in order to go to work. But this time you are going to a vacation in a beautiful paradise. Do you feel heaviness now? No, you don't, right? <laughs> you would jump out of bed immediately. So, it had nothing to do with the circumstance. I mean, sure, if you didn't sleep a minute, you are going to have some <laughs> biological and neurological issues. But most of the time, it's not about that. It's about our own resistances toward that situation and our own attachments, because we want to stay in bed, because uh, it's so cozy in bed, because you have a sa your safety blanket <laughs> on your head and so on and so on. But if you are waking up in order to go to vacation, heaviness is miraculously gone. So maybe it wasn't about getting enough sleep, just maybe it was about your own resistances. And that's an excellent news, because you create your own resistances, with your thoughts, with your emotions, and so on. And when you catch yourself that you are lying in your bed, feeling really heavy and lazy, and you don't want to get up because it is a terrible day, you need to go to work, and it's raining outside, just stop thinking. You can do that. Stop thinking for a moment and get up. And you will see that it is not that difficult. I'm not saying that you're going to enjoy it, but it is extremely less difficult than it was a few minutes ago. But first, you need to observe. You need to observe that you are feeling heavy, that you are lazy and you, are, you don't want to get out of bed. And then you can act uh, and say, oh, well, I, I don't really don't want to get out of bed. I feel really heavy. Why is that? Oh, because of my attachment. I, I'm not going to analyze it now. now. Now I'm not going to fix anything. I'm just going to get out of Just stop thinking and get out. And it will be much easier. Okay? Or maybe you opened your eyes and you had another kind of thought that saying, I don't have enough time. Now, this is a situation that we are all very familiar to. We all don't have enough time. But, you know, of, of course, technically, each and every one of us has the exactly same amount of time every day. <laughs> we have about 24 hours a day. <laughs> not a second more, not a second less. 
So when you say I don't have enough time, you don't actually mean I don't have enough time. What you mean is I have a lot to do. I have too much to do. I'm not going to make it squeeze all my assignments into this day. And you already feel guilty because you're not going to get or afraid because some of those assignments are really important or desire because you wish that you have less assignments or that you have more pleasant assignments. You, you, you wish that you could drop some of those things on your task list and just go to a massage, for example. Or ashamed or so on and so on. So you are feeling really heavy. You are lying in your bed, feeling really heavy because you don't have enough time. You have too much to do. Okay. You are lying in your bed, wasting your time and thinking about how you don't have enough time. Actually, you have as much time as everyone else, but you are creating the effect. You are creating the sensation, the experience of not having time by believing that you don't have time. And this is really a radical thought, so please just let me explain. If your first thought in the morning is, I don't have enough time, you will feel heavy and then somehow you will wield yourself out of the bed, sooner or later. <laughs> okay. And you will get out of the bed with the sensation of, let's say, vibration of anxiety. And anxiety is somewhere in the domain of fear. Maybe it can be guilt and shame because you, you, you never have enough time. Maybe it will be desire, anger, but let's say it's anxiety. For most of us, it is anxiety because we are afraid that something, we are going to miss something important. And then you are going to do things in a hurry. Since you don't have enough time, you are going to put your toast, your breakfast in a toaster and go wash your teeth. And then, while washing your teeth, maybe you will check messages on your phone. And then suddenly there is some important message in your phone. And you quickly stop washing your teeth and answer that uh, message or send an email or whatever is required, forgetting that you left the toast. And of course, the toast is over burned. And now you don't have your breakfast because it's burnt and you have to clean up and you have to you have a real emergency to, <laughs> to go through because, you know, you overburnt your toast. Because you scattered your attention. You don't have a clear focus. You have anxiety that's actually kind of fear that will create adrenaline in your body that will put you into fight or flight mode and you're going to fight the circumstances and you're going to be a little bit careless. When I say a little bit careless, I'm being kind. You're not going to focus all your attention on one particular thing. You're going to scatter your attention and that will make you sloppy. And when you are sloppy, you have additional job <laughs> of fixing your own errors. Because now you don't have your toast for breakfast, you need to fix something else. Or go to work without breakfast. And then you're hungry and you're cranky and you are going to create different kind of problems. And then you, of course, since you don't have a time, you are not going to be that careful driver. And when you are not careful in the traffic, you are going to scratch your car. Now you have even less time because now you have to fix that situation. You need to get your car to the car mechanic. And, and that is something on your task list that wasn't in the morning. You are creating all kinds of additional jobs, additional work for yourself by not being focused in what's in front of, on, in front of you. You could just e get out of the bed. I mean, you have time as much as you have. Now it's 7 a.m. and you need to get to your job, let's say, at 9 a.m. And nothing will change that. You have two hours and that's it. Use that time wisely. First, brush your teeth. 
then you can put toast in your toaster and then fix coffee while you are uh, supervising the toaster and none of these additional accidents are not going to happen. You are creating additional work for yourself. So maybe in a business environment it looks like this. this. So uh, you need to send to your client some papers. Maybe it's a contract or something like that offer for your services. And then you write that on your computer and then you say file print. You need to print five copies on that and they are for five pages, so it's about 25 pages. Your network printer in your office is going to take about a minute or two to print all those papers. Why waste my time? Because you are too busy, you need to somehow be extra, I don't know, expedient. So, while the printer is printing, you open your email. And there, of course, is something really important. And then you need to answer that and you forget about those papers in your printer. And then your colleague will print several pages of his own and come to printer and after 10 minutes, so your papers are sitting on the printer for 8 minutes, he will grab all of them. And if you are if really unlucky, he's going to send that proposal for client A to maybe his client, client B. And if you are really unlucky, client B will see from your proposal to client A that Client A has better prices for your services than he. And now you need to waste three days in apologizing, in giving the client B the same terms, same prices as client A. And you already cost your company maybe your, early, your yearly uh, well, salary. And of course, there is an embarrassment. And there may be two, three, maybe seven, maybe one month of additional work to solve the problem that just didn't need to happen. Okay. And, you know, it, it, is, it is exactly like that. You not believing that, have, you believing that you don't have enough time, create situations that are eating your time even more. And then, of course, there is that issue of multitasking. Of course, Buddha never talked about that because <laughs> it wasn't an issue in his time. But lately, in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, when we started incorporating computers and smartphones and smart devices in our home that are perfectly capable of doing several things at once, we are now incorporating that idea of multitasking into our home and business environments and we believe that it is in our best interest. We somehow feel more efficient when we are juggling several things at once. And sure, sometimes you need to juggle several things at once, but usually no, or at least not in that amount that you, that you expect that you need. And when you multitask, now this is interesting, you are less efficient and you are prone to errors. And I don't, I, I expect that you are not going to believe me. So please join me in one small test. It's going to take you about two minutes. And it is incredibly insightful.